Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. We're going to read all the way to 19. Now read for us. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. They were not able to enter because of unbelief. And as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, we have already established the fact that the author is writing to a Jewish community, a community that we we know is made up of believers, people who believe in Jesus, a group of people who are unbelievers, And people who are just on the fence, they don't really know where to go, but they're kind of on the fence and not exactly sure what decision to take. This morning, in my opinion, I believe that the author is addressing Jewish believers, believers of Christ. And the the reason I say that is, it's in verse 14, that he says the phrase, for we have become partakers of Christ. Now, there are others that will say otherwise. Uh, I guess it's a disagreement, but this is just the way I believe, and so that's how I'm approaching it this morning. And as you enter into this text, I want to begin by acknowledging something that we may fail to acknowledge. That is, one of the most important aspects of our life, one of the most amazing attributes of our life, is the capacity that we have to believe. The capacity that we have to believe in someone or something. And this is something that unites everybody in humanity, is that as soon as we are created by God, He has given us this ability to believe. From birth, when a child just a few days or a few weeks old, they believe, they establish a trust in their parents so that when they're in the arms of their parents, they are safe. They feel they are comforted. They know that they are in a place where they are safe. And you guys probably have seen this. The moment you take a child away from his parents' arms at a young age, you know, a few weeks old or a few days old, and you put him in someone else's arms, what happens? The child begins to be scared, begins to cry. Why? Because they have been taken away from that place of trust, that place of safety. And as you get older, you begin to develop belief in different people and different things. And on that moment where you're standing before your spouse or your, your, your partner at the, at the altar and you're about to say your vows, you're believing in that person. You're believing in that person to, uh, to love you, to, to be with you through all of life. And that capacity to believe establishes who we are as a person, establishes what we do. And I want you to understand that what you put your belief in not only shapes you, but it affects the people around you. What I believe will impact my daughter, will will impact the, the new baby that's coming in, will impact my spouse. What I believe will impact my church, will impact my relationship with God. It impacts all sorts of different things. It's how I believe. And it sets the course or the trajectory of my life, what it is that I believe. And I might be saying things to you guys that you may already know or seem basic and trivial, but I believe you have to understand just how precious a gift it is that we have that we can believe in someone or something as you enter this text because we're talking about believing or unbelieving. And also, as humans, and especially living in this part of the world, we're conditioned to focus on the outward performance of a person, right? We were, we're driven to, to be impressed or unimpressed by the way a person performs. But we seldom take a moment to kind of look at the inner workings of a person. What is it that's driving that person to do what he or she is doing? 
And I think in order for us to appreciate this text, that's where we got to look, is we got to look beyond the outer skeleton and kind of look at what's driving a person, what's driving you, what's driving me. Um, and I just want to bring us back to the New Testament at the Gospels. During his time on earth, Jesus made it clear that he was not impressed by outward performance. You guys remember the religious leaders of his day, how they would offer up prayers and do their pious acts. But Jesus was very clear when he says that these acts were empty, were without any substance. And he says in Matthew 15, and he references Isaiah, and he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And as we read through the Gospels, we understand that this problem isn't limited to just the religious leaders of the day, but it impacts all of humanity. In Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus says that out of the heart of a man comes all sorts of evil, all sorts of sin. Let's think about that for a moment. All of the acts of abuse that we see or have experienced, all of the violence, the acts of terror, all of the evil that you've ever seen across the news or even in your own life, all of that originated from the heart, heart of mankind. So Jesus, you know, the, 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 the thing that concerned Jesus the most wasn't to try to make people appear to be more holy or appear to be more perfect or to appear to be good. The thing that concerned Jesus was the condition of a depraved, corrupt heart. And he wanted to get at that. He wanted to get at that and figuring out a way to fix that, to restore that. In Ezekiel, it says that, uh, chapter 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And by the good news that we have, Jesus is the reason that that scripture can be fulfilled today, is that Jesus gives us the gift of salvation, the good news that we have. But in order to access that gift that Jesus has given us, there's one thing that all of humanity has to do, and that is to believe. Believe in the good news of Jesus. Believe in the reality that not only did he exist, but that he came to this earth as God's son to restore us, to, to die for us, to, to be buried and resur be resurrected so that we would have fellowship, relationship with God so that we would have a relationship with God. And not only do we believe in Jesus on a certain day and we mark it in the Bible, but we continue to believe in him. And as we continue to believe in him, we mature, we grow, we develop, and we do good things for the Lord. And I want to say that the peace we now enjoy with God, the freedom that we have to pray at any moment of the day, the purpose which we, with which we live our lives, the opportunity we have to preach Jesus to people in captivity, all of this comes to fruition because we continue to believe in Christ. We continue to believe in Christ. And I want to say that believing in Jesus is like the rudder of a ship. It may be small, it may seem like it's menial, it may, may not seem like it has a ginormous purpose, but that rudder is what directs the ship in the course that it will go. In the same way, our believing in Jesus directs our life in the way that it will go. Without believing in Christ, we're like a ship that's just on water and just goes here and there as the wind takes it, aimless, just wandering without a purpose. So I want you to, to understand the importance of, or the role of believing and how important it is not just to bring us into salvation, but to sustain us, to, to carry us through. Look back with me to, to verses 12 and 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Let me stop there just for a second. The author of Hebrews tells the, the, the Jewish community to take care. Now, the Greek word for take care is blepo. I'm not a Greek expert. It sounds funny to even say it, but... The word means to, to be on guard or to, to, to really look closely, to, to be on the lookout. 
And the author is basically saying here, he wants the church, he wants the believers to know that you must be really careful so that you do not come to a place where you develop this unbelieving, evil heart. And I think these are, are interesting verses because, again, I believe he's speaking to a group of believers. So these are people who already have experienced Jesus, who are already believers of who Jesus is and what he's done. But it, it, this is especially important to us because he's helping us understand that just because we are believers of Jesus Christ, we are not immune to developing an unbelieving or an evil heart. You see what I'm saying? Just because we attended church or just because we, you know, have been following Jesus for several years, it doesn't mean that we're exempt from developing a heart of stone or heart of unbelief towards God. And that, to me, is scary. To, to the, the reality of coming to God and, and you know, doing all the things that I would do to, to worship God and going through the motions, to know that I would could come to a place where I'm evil or unbelieving in my heart, that scares me. Because if I am not careful to look at my life, and, and I have these thoughts coming in, that it doesn't just affect me, but it affects the people I love. It affects my family. It affects my spouse, my children. It would affect my church if I continue to possess a heart or if I have this heart that's unbelieving or evil. The author wants us to take care, to be really careful, to be on guard, to be on the lookout to see if there is anything in us that will lead us to a place of being in unbelief or, or having this heart of wickedness. And I want you to understand, if we are disconnected from a relationship with the living God and we develop a cold, callous heart, then not only do we suffer, but we are hurting people around us. So I just want to begin by urging you to pay attention to what he's got to say. In verse 13, he says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In that last phrase, we have an understanding of what leads us to having an evil, unbelieving heart. And that phrase is, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I want you guys to look at that phrase. And I want you guys to think about a sin or sins that you are presently struggling with, whatever that might be, whether it be pornography, addiction, uh, whatever it is. And I want you to look back at that phrase, and I want you to substitute that sin in place of the word sin. And I want you to read it to yourself. So, for example, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of addiction. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of pornography so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of the love of money. Whatever your sin is, whatever my sin is, the end result is the same. We're left deceived. It always brings about deception. And at first, sin will come at us, enticing us to promise us that we're going to be fulfilled, that we're going to be satisfied, we're going to be able to have an escape. And for a moment, you will. For a moment. But after that moment passes, you are left cheated, you're left used, you're left defeated, you're left worse off than you began. Sin always does that to us, it deceives us. I told you earlier that our journey in Christ begins when we believe in Him. Well, Satan wants nothing more than to destroy our believing in him by bringing about this deception of sin in our lives. He wants nothing more than to disconnect our relationship with God by really just fanning up the flames of sin in our lives. And the more and more we engage in a specific sin or a group of sins, what happens is, is our heart, heart is becoming more and more cold and callous, hard as stone towards God. You know, I know of a close loved one um, who, on the surface, looked like he had it together. On the surface, he looked as if he was attending church, he was doing the right things. 
But he was someone that was struggling with sin. And none of us knew about it. He never opened up about it to any one of us. And over the days, over the months, and over the years, it escalated, it escalated to the point that at the end, there was nothing any one of us could have done. All, but, all we could really do was weep because we saw the way his sin took over his life. And all we could do was weep, weep with his family, and we had no words. There was nothing we could have done. And he let, he let it go on and on and on until it was too late. And not to say that God can't forgive him where he's at right now, but to say that because the, the, he engaged in it for so long, it created such a problem for him, and it, it affected him in a deep way. This morning, I want to bring you to the attention of verse 13 when it says, Encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In this very verse, the author gives us an answer to how we can avoid falling into a path of deceitfulness, and that is to encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today. Keep encouraging one another. My friends, if you are one of the ones and if you're engaging in some sort of sin or sins, I want you to understand that you don't have to carry that weight of that guilt or the shame alone. The author clearly tells us that we're not supposed to carry it alone. We are meant to receive encouragement. And that word encouragement in the Greek means parakleo. It means someone coming alongside of you and supporting you and strengthening you. I want you to understand that whatever you might be going through, whatever sin it is that you're having that's, that's causing you to, to kind of maintain the state of deception, I just want to implore you to share that with someone. Um, in our community groups that we have, I encourage you to share it with folks in your community groups or people in leadership here at this church. I just implore you because before it's too late, before you continue spiraling down to a path of, of becoming utterly hardened towards God and the things of God, the presence of God, before you begin to face consequences that really are damaging to you, please reach out. Please receive encouragement. And if you are one who can provide encouragement, I encourage you to do that. Looking at the people in your life who you know are struggling, who are hurting, who are in sin, providing whatever encouragement that you can to sustain them, to uphold them, to be their perikleo, to sustain them and strengthen them so that they can overcome whatever it is that they're engaged with. Like I said, based on this verse, you and I were never meant to do it on our own. I know what America teaches us. I know we're supposed to be individualistic and be solo, but not so with the church. We were never meant to do this on our own. So do not fool yourself into thinking that you can do it on your own. Please reach out. Please ask someone for help so that you don't spiral down into a path where you're disengaged with God altogether. It doesn't get easier as you prolong. Please reach out and get some help. Um, in verse 14, uh, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance Firm until the end. I don't know when you guys experienced salvation, but I remember I was around eight years old. My mother took me aside. And I really hate those mom-son talks. They just take forever. And I felt like, I feel like more of a therapist to my mom as I've gotten older. But this specific moment in time, it was very important to me because my mom took the time to explain the gospel to me when I was eight. And it was when I was eight that I really felt convicted by my sin. Now, it's kind of weird for me to think about young people like me or even younger feeling that weight of conviction of my sin. What did I do? Did I hit my sister in the face? Did I steal something from somebody? I mean, yeah, probably. That, I mean, sin. But for me, at that point, it did convict me. I felt the weight of conviction of the sin. But I remember my mom telling me a verse that conveyed for me the love of God, and that was in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And some of you guys might know that. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. From that verse, I just felt the sense of God's love for me, and I experienced salvation. And from that moment on, 
I was anchored in God's love. Now, along the way, God has shown me more and more examples of his love for me that have anchored me along the way, but it all began back then. And what I believe the author is trying to convey to us this morning is that we are all partakers of Jesus, and in a few moments we'll be having communion, and we're, 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 that's a symbolic representation of the fact that we're all become partakers of who he is and what he's done for us. But what the author is wanting us to understand is remember to hold fast that experience of salvation that you have had. Remember to hold fast the moment where you realized God's love for you. The moment where you realize your, the sense that you were convicted by your sin. And you guys have had your experiences and you've known it in different ways at different times. But the author is wanting us to understand we have to hold fast to that experience. And some of you in here may not have experienced that. But, and I would love to talk with you afterwards. But I want you to know that God has love for you. God's love is for you. And we're going to talk about it further on. Demonstrated through his son. Hold fast. The reason we have to hold fast is this, is that all around you, as, as we even speak, and even, even as you're sitting here today, there are many distractions, there are many things this world is going to throw at you to try to lure you away from God's love, God's presence. I mean, you don't have to but walk down the street just for a moment, and you're just engulfed with all sorts of things that are trying to distract you, disconnect you from your relationship with God. And that's why it's so important to hold on to your foundation. Remember, hold fast to the things that God has shown you about him and his love, how you experience your salvation. I want to share with you an image that came to mind as I was reading this and I was thinking about what it meant to hold fast. Um, in the book of Ruth, we've talked about it here from this, uh, from in this church as well, there's a, a moment in time when Naomi returns home to Bethlehem. And as she's returning home, her sons have just died. Her two sons have just died. Her husband has died. So she's leaving and going back to her home with really no one. Now, her daughters-in-law are following along her, Orpah and Ruth. But she wants them to go back to Moab. She wants them to leave, all right? And she basically tells them at a certain point in their journey, okay, you guys are free to go. I thank you for the way you've loved me. Thank you for the way you've taken care of me but you guys are free to go back to Moab. And they refuse to leave. They're crying, they're weeping before Naomi because they want to kind of tag along with their mother-in-law. Totally unheard of. But anyway, they, they, they do. And so Naomi reminds them this, is that, uh, look, if you follow me, I am not going to be able to have children for you to have husbands with or have husbands, or I'm not, you're not going to come with me and be able to have children of your own. You're not going to have a settled life. But if you go back to Moab, you can have a husband, you can have children, you can have a settled life. So at hearing that, Orpah lets go, and she goes back to Moab. But what do we read in Ruth? Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth clings to, to Naomi. And that image of clinging, that image of Ruth just clenching Naomi, is what I believe it means for us to hold fast to that same intensity, that same passion. Ruth knew that Naomi, I mean, she experienced a revelation of God somehow in some way through that family. And her husband has died. The other men have died. The only link that she has to the things of God, to the presence of God, is Naomi. And so she wasn't about to let go, even though it meant that she would have to give up her livelihood, her chance of becoming a wife, or having a chance of becoming a mother. She was determined to let all of that go in order that she would cling to God. And Naomi was the only person, the only example, the only revelation of God that she had left. And so that image is what we need to carry in our life when we think about God in terms of holding fast to salvation. You're going to be lured away with the cares of this world. It's inevitable. It says it in Scripture. But how will you respond? Will you simply let go and just do what the world is you know, luring you to do? Or will you hold on? Will you cling fast to, to God, to His Word? 
In verses 15 to 19, we are looking at a portion of Scripture that's referring to a time in Israel's history where Moses is leading Israel out of Egypt. Let me start by reading verse 15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. The scriptures tell us that God through the Holy Spirit has spoken these words. And it's referring to a time in Israel's history when they are captive or held captive by Egypt. 400 years of captivity in Egypt. And in that time, they are crying out to God, praying to God that he would somehow deliver them from the captivity that they're in. Because not only are they captive by Egypt, but they are slaves of Egypt. And as they're crying out and as they are praying, God responds to them through Moses. How many of you guys have seen Ten Commandments? Anybody in here seen Ten Commandments? Okay. Well, you guys are aware of this specific moment in history when Moses goes in before Pharaoh, and you guys remember the ten plagues and the interaction, and so the people of Israel are starting to get an understanding that God is beginning to do something. You know, God is beginning to do something, and then ultimately, God through Moses frees, Egypt, frees Israel from Egypt, and they begin to walk out, the, out of the country, and then they begin to experience this amazing, miraculous provision of the parting of what? The Red Sea. And as they're walking through, they feel and experience ultimate salvation, ultimate victory. I want you to take a moment just to imagine what it would have felt like to be one among them after your ancestors, after generations before you had experienced captivity. You are the one who has an opportunity to walk out and into freedom. Imagine the joy that's surging through your veins. Imagine the, the excitement in the children around you as they see that they are no longer in captivity. They are free. They can run. They can laugh. They can just scream as loud as they want. And God promises them that they are going into a promised land, a land that he has in store for them. But along the way, it, it just seems like within moments of crossing the Red Sea, Israel begins to grumble against God. Israel begins to raise their fists, begins to, in anger, begins to, 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 to rebel against God. They even had the audacity to say that it would have been better for us to be back in Egypt than to be here right now following you. They even had the audacity to say that it would have been better for us to be back in captivity then be here right now following you. And one day after another, moment by moment, God judges Israel. God delivers Israel. God judges Israel. God delivers Israel. Ultimately to the point where God's anger was provoked. And we read words like provoked. We read words like God is angry. God swears that the Israelites will never enter his rest. It conveys to you and to me the utter rage that God had against this country that he rescued. The, God, the, the country that he rescued that were called by his name, turning their backs upon him, worshiping a golden calf, doing all sorts of dis things to, to hurt their relationship with him. God ultimately is furious with them. So that, as, as it says here in scriptures, they didn't enter into the promised land because of what? Their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. And my friends, this morning, I want you to understand that you have experienced salvation, but I want you to be very careful. I want you to take care, as it says here in Hebrews, to, to understand where are you at in your state of believing Jesus right now where are you at in your walk with Christ right now? Are you deceived by sin? Are you walking with him? Where are you? Where are you at? Are you one among the Israelites, shaking your fist at God in anger, or you're just ignorant of God altogether? I want you to know that if you're not connected with God, then you're not going to experience the purpose and the plans or the promised land that he's trying to, to bring you to. I mean, you're, you've experienced salvation, but it's not a one-and-done thing. 
God has a specific plan and a purpose for each of us. God has places that he wants to take us in life. God has a desire that he wants to accomplish in and through us. But if we come to a place where we are going to rebel and be wicked and evil towards God, how can we expect for God to take us to the promised land, whatever that might be, mean for us? That purpose that he has for us, that, that, the desire that he created us for, what, how can we reach there if we're not engaged with him? And this is especially scary to me because these are people who firsthand witnessed the parting of the Red Sea. These are people who firsthand experienced the plagues. They firsthand experienced manna falling from heaven. They experienced God's handiwork. Right? These are people who firsthand had a count of, of what was going on. Yet even still, they rejected God. Even still, they rebelled against God. How much more for us, who on an average day, we probably don't see the Red Sea get departed. I don't normally see bread falling down from heaven. I don't know about you guys. I don't. Not to say God isn't super, God can't do those things. I'm just saying that I don't see it as much as they did every day where they experience God's supernatural power at work, but yet they still manage to rebel against God. It just means, it just means that we have to be extremely careful in understanding where we are at, are at in, our, in the condition, condition of our heart. This morning, I want to close by reminding you of the three things that the author tells us in the book of Hebrews, in, the, in this chapter of Hebrews. One, he tells us to take care. Aleppo, the Greek word that means to, to be very careful and discerning, seeing what's going on. And that's the first thing I want you guys to understand is, is really take a care, careful look at the condition of your heart. Take careful look at where your heart is with respect to God. And like we said, just because you're a believer of Christ doesn't mean that you're immune to developing a heart of stone or a heart of unbelief or, or evil. Take care. Examine very closely what's going on inside. We also looked at encouraging one another day after day. And so as you guys are looking at your heart and you see that there's something inside of you that's wrong, you're, you're seeing sin inside of you, and you for so long have left it to yourself, you've ignored it, the Bible tells us we are in call to receive encouragement. We are called not to be alone, but to receive support, have a paracleo come alongside us and support us and strengthen us. So I encourage you guys, reach out, get help. And I, I encourage others to provide encouragement and support to those who are struggling, who need help. And lastly, the author tells us to hold fast. Hold fast to the, to the love of God, to the moment in your life where you experienced his salvation, to the moment that you experienced his grace over your life, the moment that you realized your conviction of sin, to the moment that you realized his love for you. Hold fast with the intensity, with the passion like no other, just as Ruth clung to Naomi. Hold fast so that no matter what winds of this world will blow against you, torrential winds, hurricane-like winds, whatever it is that would blow against you, that you would still be found clinging to the assurance of God's love for you, God's word over your life, holding fast to his presence. In a few moments, we're going to be taking communion. And I want you guys to examine your life in terms of where you're at with the Lord. Where are you at in your condition of believing in Him? And I want you to take a moment just to reflect on His love for you. Every Sunday as we take communion, we understand that the bread represents the body of Christ, the blood represents His blood that was shed for us. And like, you know, just like every other day, I just want you guys just to take a moment to, to reflect on his personal and his intimate love for your life. It is not just some general love that God kind of bestows on people, but he 
genuinely, specifically, personally loves you. He knows your condition. He knows your situation. He knows the struggles you carry, the burdens you carry. He knows what it is that you're going through. And in spite of that, he wants you to know, I love you. And every moment as we take that bread and as we drink of that cup, we are reminded again of his immense, infinite love towards us. And so as we take a moment to reflect and to think upon it, I just want you guys to be, to re, just to really concern yourself with, do I really, am I at a point in life where I've gotten to be so cold towards God that I just simply take the bread, I drink of the cup just because it's what we do. You know, it's just because it's, it's what I do. It's, it's what's expected of me. And, you know, I, I just hope and I pray that the same fire from which you first loved God would be the same fire that's growing and growing and growing day after day. And it's leading you to, to do greater things for the Lord and to, 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 to experience greater revelations of his presence. But it all begins when you have a firm grasp and an understanding of his love for you. So this morning, I just want you to reflect and think upon that. In just a moment as I leave, you're free to, to take of the bread and drink of the, or to at least grab the elements and then Sam will lead us in terms of taking, partaking of the bread and the cup. But just, just think, think upon where you're at, reflect on his love over your life and maybe something you realize is personal to you. Close your eyes with me, let's, bow, let's, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you and we praise you, God, for Jesus. We thank you that he came into this world and wasn't concerned about the external parts of us, wasn't concerned about our outward appearance, but that he knew our true problem was what was going on on the inside of us. I'm so grateful to you, God. We are all so grateful to you that as he suffered, was killed, was buried, and rose again, that through Jesus, we have been given a new heart, a new spirit. And now we live with a purpose and, a, and, a, and an assurance that we are a new creation, created by you for your good purpose on this planet. And God, I do pray for my friends here and myself today that we would examine our lives closely to see if there has been any, over the course of time, if there has been anything in us to, to take away from believing that truth, if there's been any sin in us, if there's been anything that we have done to allow ourselves to develop a heart of stone towards you, I ask that you would reveal that to us so that we would confront that, and not alone, but with each other, with the encouragement of each other, and ultimately that we would be restored in your and our understanding of you and your love for us, and, and ultimately, God, that we would hold fast uh, to the truth of your love over our lives. God, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love. We thank you that he has given us a purpose through believing in him. And I do pray for those among us today who have not yet made that decision. I pray that they would, be, would, would experience your Holy Spirit just convicting them this morning and that they would reach out to us for more information and We'll ultimately experience salvation through Jesus as well. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.